of thing. Right. These are the key points. So uh, if you can't remember anything following this slide, remember what's on here. The key points are that banks create money. Okay, and we will just re go through again the, the mechanism by which banks create the money supply uh, when they create credit. Uh, the second point is that this system has some inherent problems with it that are quite severe. So we're going to just talk about what those are. They're particularly if you have an interest in ecological sustainability or social outcomes. Uh, then the final point is that monetary policy, as it's currently formulated, isn't really effective in addressing any of these fundamental issues. Uh, in a sense, it's not intended to. It's, it's blind to some of them. It's ineffective in other ways. Well, that's what we're going to argue. So if you like, the first part is entirely factual. Uh, the second and third parts are, are more of a, a put, putting forward a case, I suppose. So um, what that actually says, and apologies that it's uh, skipped out of place, is that um, a quote from Mervyn King, when banks extend loans to their customers, they create money by crediting their customers' accounts. He said that in 2012. It's quite nice because it's sort of, I mean, although there are lots of central bank statements that make it very plain that what banks do is create money, this one is particularly plain. And so it's very useful to uh, refer economists to who are struggling with this concept. And uh, th the reason why this is so important, of course, is as Stiglitz pointed out, that, um, you know, macroeconomic models uh, we're in the habit of, and still are indeed, of, of just excluding the banking system and money because they assumed that the economy was a, basically a bartering system. You didn't need to put money in there. Uh, it's all Adam Smith's fault, really. Um, but uh, those macroeconomic models, therefore, were um, uh, blind to sort of the, the build-up of credit crises. Um, so so why, are, why are banks missing? Um, well, because the, the normal model of the real economy looks like this. In, in sort of standard economic modeling. And it's not that you shouldn't have models like that necessarily. All models can tell you something, but these models aren't very good at telling you about credit creation, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, so there's a circular model you often get in economics textbooks. You've got firms and households. Uh, you've got wages and salary going to the workers who consume goods and services. That's all very nice. Let's put the government in. So uh, the government, you pay taxes to the government and they spend. So that's another source of, of circulating money around the economy. So uh, that's kind of roughly where uh, macroeconomic models stop. But where are the banks? So, uh, well, that raises the question, what do banks do? Well, this is what even people like Paul Krugman actually claim banks do quite extraordinarily. They claim that they take granny's savings and they lend them out to, here's an ecstatic small business owner who's just received the loan. Um, yes, it's all entirely fictional. Um, so b because, because investment actually proceeds, cr the creation of credit proceeds as savings as we're just about to discover. So this might be true for Zopa. That's what Zopa does, peer-to-peer -peer lending. It actually takes somebody's money and lends it to somebody else. That's not at all what banks do. Quite simply isn't what banks do. So, let's, so, so this is this traditional picture of the banks, savers, and going into investment there. That's not quite right. This is what it should look like. Well, because as it says here, if that's true, where actually does the original money come from in the first place? Well, it comes from here. So we put banks and financial institutions into the picture. What they do is that they create credit, they create new deposits, and they can lend these primarily to, um, well, the financial sector's not in here, but that's, you know, let, let's just sort of leave that out for now. So we've got firms doing real production investment. We've got workers, uh, or consumers, more to the point, I suppose, borrowing money. The government even borrows money, or at least it, it borrows the money via the financial markets. And uh, then, of course, you've then got interest flows and debt servicing and repayments that go back. And various, various people in this picture benefit from interest flows. So that's a more complete picture of the economy that shows that banks are really very uh, crucial for being the driver of this flow of money into the economy and a flow of money back out. And that's very significant for shaping, actually, what the consumption, investment, and purchasing patterns are in the economy. Uh, a lot of that then, you know, is dependent on what decisions are made here with the credit. So now we're going to uh, do some double entry bookkeeping. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, enthusiastic accountant in the audience. So I'm going to just take you through the bank uh, balance sheets, and again, I I know that some of you this just this will be sort of um, very old hat, but uh, we thought it was useful just going through the basic grounding in the mechanism by which banks do create. Money. So we're starting off with a simplified bank balance sheet. Um, you know, the, the key thing is perhaps for our purposes on the loan, on the asset side, are customer loans. 
Um, there are other key, key assets that banks have, um, not least central bank reserves and cash. And on the liabilities side, they have, you know, they have, some, they have their own capital. They might have some bondholders who they owe money to. So that's another liability. Interbank borrowing. And deposits. Customer deposits are a liability of the bank. That is money. Um, under any recognizable, ordinary sense of the term, that's what people in the street think is money. It's bank deposits. Uh, we have had the odd argument, not least with an official at the Vickers Commission, who tried to claim that this was not money. Uh, but, I mean, that, that's just a tortuous uh, sort of playing with words, really. It clearly is money, so that's the deposits. So, um, however, it is true to say that the central bank reserves here is also money. And this, I think, is a lot of the source of confusion when you are talking with people. And sometimes, you know, people are talking about central bank reserves or narrow money uh, as, or base money as being the thing that they'd like to call money. And you might be having a conversation where you'd like to call deposits money or broad money. And they are two distinctly different types of money because one can only be used by banks to settle between themselves. Um, that's the base money or narrow money. Broad money is what uh, ordinary people use, if you like, or the rest of the economy uses, broad money. So uh, useful to always know if you're having a discussion with somebody about money creation, be aware that they, they might be holding in their head this thing and actually you're trying to talk about you know, money as it is for most people. So um, the act of creating new money, here we go. Hold your hats. Uh, step one, a bank signs a loan agreement with somebody. The bank's now got an asset. It's going to have a flow of interest from this, this loan agreement. It's going to get repaid. That is an asset, puts it on its balance sheet. Uh, the wonder of double entry bookkeeping requires there to be an equal and opposite, opposite entry. In this case, it is uh, the bank credits the borrower's account with that sum of money. It just types the numbers in. That's its liability. Everything matches. The accountants are happy because the double entry has been done. And what you've done is you've created a brand new deposit. And now, of course, it doesn't end there because you wouldn't borrow money simply to, to leave it in the account. So the next step is you spend the money. So you borrow the money to buy a car or whatever. So you spend the money. Now, what happens then? Well, what happens is that there we go. So your bank, when you spend your money and you order it to, to, to be sort of paid off to another, I'm assuming it goes to another bank, you've, you know, your car dealer has banks with somebody else, uh, your bank then has to settle that same amount through the intrabank clearing system using its central bank reserves, its reserves at the central bank. And uh, so that should now disappear. There we go. So we've got an equal, you probably can't see it, but you know, I've shown a, a, a lump disappearing up here equal to the lump disappearing down there. The balance sheet still balances. And, uh, and there we are. So, uh, of course, it doesn't end then there either because our bank now has, has used up some of its stock of reserves at the central bank. What's it going to do about that? Well, it needs to replenish its reserves at the end of the day, assuming that you know, it ends up on a, on a down, you know, ends up at the end of the day, doesn't have equal amount of reserves coming in. So it, but that's no problem because it can go into the interbank borrowing markets and uh, it can borrow some surplus reserves off another bank. See, the interesting thing about this system, it's a closed system with all these reserves amongst all the different banks. So if one bank is short at the end of the day, that must mean that some other bank has got a surplus of reserves. And they will simply lend them back to the first bank on the interbank borrowing markets. Or at least they will if all is well, uh, if they are scared of lending to each other and that bank, uh, you know, interbank borrowing market freezes then, you, then that's roughly the conditions under which Northern Rock crashed. That was the, that was the original, that's what credit crunch actually meant originally. It was the inability of banks to, uh, unwillingness of banks to lend to each other. And that really stuffs up this credit creation process. Uh, as you can see, because it's vital that this bank is able to create deposits, pay them away using its central bank reserves, safe in the knowledge it can borrow back whatever central bank reserves it needs. But under normal conditions, it can. Uh, just to make the point, this is a sort of model of the interbank clearing uh, system. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of making the point that if you imagine that the, all these pots in each of the banks that have got central bank reserves in, they're always flowing in between all these pots as they're clearing all of the, the transactions during, throughout the day, intraday clearing. And, uh, but at the, at the end of the day, they will want to make sure that each of them have a sort of sufficient uh, liquidity position of central bank reserves, but they will, they will quite simply... Um, so square that through interbank borrowing. So uh, this is the final part on this bit is uh, 
for the benefit of uh, any financial journalist in the room who it seems to me uh, unbelievably always seem to confuse these next two concepts, I'm going to clarify two concepts. One is uh, what the fractional reserve is referring to. So if customers uh, try to clash in their claims too quickly, i.e. they want to go and withdraw their deposits, and this is what happened with Northern Rock, of course, and you find that um, the bank hasn't got enough central bank reserves to settle its payments going flying out of the bank to all these other banks, then uh, you've basically got, um, well, if no one will lend to it and the, and the Bank of England doesn't step in, then you've got a bank that's run out of reserves. That's a liquidity crisis because it can't, it can't meet the claims on it uh, in the short term. And so that's slightly different from, but very linked to, the next problem, which is capital adequacy. And what that is about, that's on, also, uh, that's on the other side of the bank, sheet, bank balance sheet. If a bank has these assets, these loans that it's made or other assets, and it's ter they turn out to be bad and it makes a whole load of losses on those, so uh, we'll hopefully see, there we go. It's, that's roughly what, <laughs> that's what bank balance sheets currently really look like. They're full of holes, but they're not really disclosed. Um, so, so it's made losses on lots of its assets. Ooh, okay, what does it do about that? Well, something's got to give on the other side because it's got to be matched by something. It, of course, if it makes losses, it has to come out of the uh, bank shareholders' equity capital. But in this case, of course, I've shown it so that it's wiped out all of its equity capital. So it will again become bankrupt, but for a slightly different reason. This is because it's become... Uh, hold on. It's, yes, it'll wipe out its own capital and become bankrupt. So... The need to hold sufficient equity or capital against your assets is what's referred to in the capital adequacy or capital reserve ratios. And that's trying to sort of ensure that a bank has, it, has enough equity capital to absorb losses that it might make. Um, the liquidity or fractional reserve ratios refer to its ability to have enough central bank reserves or liquidity here to meet the payments as they go out. Two slightly different things. Um, neither of them, incidentally, when you regulate them, are particularly effective at constraining banks' overall ability to create credit, which is a slight problem. So uh, I'm just going to leave you with this. You've probably all seen these before, so I won't dwell on it. Lots of quotes from central banks that just um, say the same thing, really, that this process that I've just described is absolutely the mechanics of how banks create the money supply. Um, if it seems like I'm ramming this point home a lot, it's because... Um, as indeed Michael Kumhoff, uh, I believe, said to Drew the other day via email that he's still struggling to convince economists that this is actually what happens, um, which is quite extraordinary. But I suppose they haven't worked in banks. Maybe we should uh, not be too hard on them. If only they weren't in charge of anything, it would be all right. So um, problems with this system, next session, it's from Adair Turner, who's been coming up with all sorts of interesting things in the last couple of years. He said, the financial crisis occurred because we failed to constrain the private financial system's creation of private credit and money. So here we are, the former head of financial regulation mm -hmm. uh, leading up to the crash saying, oh dear, the crash happened because we didn't constrain credit creation. So it's nice that he spotted this um, after the event. Um, and what, so why is that? So why is that? What's, what are the problems with the system? Well, first problem is that the incentives for private banks, I mean, so you're leaving credit creation, money creation to private banks. Arguably, that was a very good idea in days gone past. It was probably better to leave it to them. They gave it for productive investment, you know, better that than some sort of despotic sovereign. But, uh, of course, these days, the institutions now in charge of this, they have incentives that generally favour them to do large-scale lending rather than SME lending. They prefer to make loans against collateral rather than loans against future cash flows. So that biases them towards lending against property and against lending for businesses. Uh, they, it, it, it means that you will have decisions on allocation of where this credit goes in the economy made in head offices in London by economists who say, oh, I don't like the look of the, uh, you know, the sort of restaurant industry uh, this quarter, and yet there'll be some fabulous you know, loan proposal for a restaurant uh, down in Cornwall that the local manager knows will go great guns, but he will be overruled by the, uh, the central credit allocation system. Um, they, it, uh, well, this is a fairly big one for some of you in the audience. Of course... The banks have absolutely no need to take any account of the impacts of the things that they have created this new money to fund, which is extraordinary when you think about it. I mean, if what we're about is an economy that supports 
you know, uh, good environmental and social outcomes as well as a prosperous uh, uh, economy, then the idea that there's no room in the creation of new money for deciding, for determining what the social ecological impacts are is, is, a, bit of a, is a bit of a flaw. Um, and then, you know, the final problem, which is quite significant, I think we've got a, a chart for this later on, so I shall hold off on that one, is that um, there are positive feedback loops in this system, which, which create bubbles. So, um, who regulates credit, bank credit creation? Well, in terms of the, uh, the liquidity, I mean, what constrains the ability of banks in aggregate to create all this money, is I suppose what I'm trying to say. So, the first thing that might, con might constrain it is the requirement on banks to keep a certain amount of central bank reserves as a ratio of their deposits. But um, unfortunately, we didn't actually have a specific ratio in the UK before the crash. Um, and in any case, as we've discovered, the point about the Bank of England, really, as lender of last resort, is it will always supply whatever central bank reserves are needed into the system to keep it stable. So this, does this really constrain banks? Not really sure. Probably not. Capital ratios, uh, well, this is, the, this is the whole solution, isn't it? Basel, we've got more yet more Basel rules, which are going to require banks to have a little bit more capital. Does that constrain their ability to create credit? Well, not if they're all creating credit in step, and uh, not if they're making lots of money on that credit, because that adds to their capital. So it's not running something that can really constrain a build-up or a boom. Interest rates, well, that's, I suppose, the, thing, the main thing that's supposed to regulate this system. Uh, but, well, we're going to talk about that later on in monetary policy, but it's just worth noting that interest rates are not set in order to hit a certain quantity of credit and certainly nothing to do with any kind of allocation of credit. I mean, the interest rates are really uh, manipulated in order to hit a certain inflation target. And so it, what it boils down to is the primary constraint on uh, the amount of new money uh, created and where it goes is, is how uh, confident banks feel about who to lend to. So... Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit. I'm going to, this, is the, this is the positive feedback loop. This is from Turner, but all it basically says is, you know, house prices start to rise. Everybody thinks, I want to buy a house because the price is going to go up. So uh, they, ask for, they ask for more mortgages. Um, and that means that banks say, oh, look, house prices are going up, so we're now happy to lend. So they will offer more mortgages. And the combination of those two things increases the house price. Everybody then thinks, oh, I really do need to buy a house now because they go up really quickly. And the banks say, oh, look, we've got to get into this market and lend even more mortgages because it's going up really quickly. And it's a positive feedback loop. That ends in a bust, as all bubbles do. Uh, so uh, this is the point about allocation. You know, um, very, very quickly, this is GDP um, uh, indexed from 1970. And the red line is the total amount of the money supply. Now, there's no reason why those two things should be exactly in line. But I mean, I think it's a reasonable indication that the creation of money has had not a lot to do with tracking the um, provision of medium of exchange for the economy, for the real economy, if you like. It's all gone into other things. And here's a clue as to where a lot of it's gone. I'm only going to sh I highlight two bits in here. The, the, the bottom one, this is from 97 onwards. That blue one is the total stock of credit outstanding to the productive sector, retailing, manufacturing, house construction. Uh, that's really not gone anywhere, particularly. It hasn't gone up much, and yet the overall quantity has almost trebled in that, in that period up to the peak. The big movers, commercial property speculation, financial uh, lending between the financial <coughs> sector. And what that's led to, of course, is that we've got an enormously higher stock of debt, total debt. It's not government debt that necessarily is the worry. In fact, many would argue it's not a worry at all at current levels. But, however, private debt, which is the households here, and firms there as a ratio to GDP is, has built up to really quite high levels by historic standards. And the blue is interbank lending, which has also grown. I'm not going to read that out, but that's, uh, that's Richard Kuh, an economist, explaining how balance sheet recessions... Okay. Sorry? Oh, that's better. Yes, thank you. Um, this point about uh, when, when you have a balance sheet recession and banks and indeed firms are all trying to reduce their debt, particularly with banks, that means that they are... Um, reducing their creation of new money, but they do need to repair their balance sheets. Does that mean that you can try and re-stimulate that through more private debt? So what the answer we've got now is to try and re-stimulate the economy through getting people to borrow more again, particularly in mortgages. So what you'll hear later on are uh, at least um, one proposal that says, well, we don't have that can't work, but actually there is another way of stimulating money supply without creating more debt. 
as we're saying, more private debt is not the answer. So to finish off, hopefully just within uh, the time, um, the section on monetary policy here. So what that one says, this is in the Bank of England website actually. What is monetary policy for? It's to deliver price stability, right? low inflation, and subject to that, to support the government's economic objectives, including those for growth and employment. So what's the context of monetary policy? So I mean, you know, we're going to talk about monetary policy as just for five minutes. Um, now before you get, just in case you get all excited by today's figures on the economy, and that growth's projected now be 2.8% next year, according to the Bank of England, and unemployment's going to fall uh, faster than usual, just look at that massive output gap that is a result of the recession following the financial crisis. So, um, you know, anemic GDP growth here is hardly anything to shout about when you consider how much production was lost. Uh, the same story with, with unemployment. Let's just remember where, we, where we've come from. Uh, you know, we, we, we've come from here up to here. And okay, it's undoubtedly good news that we're going to creep back down to 7% a bit quicker than everybody thought, maybe sometimes towards the end of the next year. But nevertheless, we are still an economy that has enormous unused resources, particularly in the form of people, and untapped spare capacity. So that is not a success story. So what can fiscal policy be doing about it? Here's government income. And by the way, these are all uh, Drew's excellent slides. Can't claim credit for them. Very nice. Um, so the government income and expenditure, or fiscal policy, as it's known, uh, as you can see, that um, here's the surpluses run by the last uh, Labour government, and the deficits, difference between uh, income here and expenditure there, sort of, you know, pr pretty moderate by historical standards up to the crash uh, when, of course, the, the, de the deficit explodes because as a result of the financial crisis. And so, rightly or wrongly, you can debate the need for a fiscal stimulus, but we are in a period where both or all the main parties are agreed that there is no room or they, don't, they wish to not use fiscal stimulus uh, you know, they, don't want, they want to narrow that gap, they're not, they're not into the idea of borrowing more to invest, and so that leaves fiscal policy out of the picture. So monetary policy really is the only tool we've got left. So monetary policy, is the current monetary policy um, uh, going to get us out of this fix? Well, it's doubtful that it can, because one of the core purposes that we're talking about here is just to, it's just to have stable consumer prices. Just consumer prices, and this is part of the problem. Uh, so in other words, you can have asset price inflation all you like, and the bank won't necessarily act on it. At least it won't change interest rates. And equally, monetary policy has got nothing to do with, the, with um, trying to encourage a more productive allocation of credit in the economy, whereas the two proposals you're going to hear in a moment, both are very much concerned with quality as well as quantity. And uh, here's another issue is that we mustn't forget that monetary policy pretends to be a neutral, sort of technocratic thing almost, um, outside the democratic decision-making process. But it has significant distributional impacts. So if you favour low inflation, that is favouring creditors over debtors, um, and having no attempt to control asset prices will tend to uh, favour owners of assets. Equally, these are the tools that we use, and I've put in brackets neoliberal era, um, just to indicate that monetary policy looked very different prior to, say, the 1970s. But this is what it's been like for 30 years odd. Um, you just basically have a bank base rate. Actually, I'm ignoring the monetarist era there, maybe, say, the last 20 years. So you use the, ba the, bank, ba the bank base rate, uh, and you simply manipulate that to try and alter the amount of economic activity, the amount of borrowing as well. Um, and... Uh, that, of course, hit the rocks when it got, went down to half percent. You couldn't lower it anymore, and yet the economy still needed to be stimulated. Um, so this is why we entered the era of so-called unconventional monetary policy. It's questionable whether it's actually unconventional. But nevertheless, um, it is what we've got into. So quantitative easing and funding for lending, Josh is going to talk a lot more about later on. Um, and we've got sort of things that maybe look a bit like fiscal policy that are being used from the Treasury to directly try and actually guide credit into particular sectors, uh, some into small businesses, um, but most into mortgages. It might be questionable whether those are the right sectors for it to be guiding credit into. But nevertheless, that's the set of tools that we have at the moment. And uh, we would argue that uh, between the lot of them, they haven't ended up, they haven't managed to do anything for rebalancing really the economy. 
they are in fact rather powerless to um, ensure a steady flow of new investment into those parts of the economy that would be environmentally beneficial or socially beneficial. Uh, and many would argue because it not, doesn't see itself as its job to do that. But if this is the only, if monetary policy is the only game left in town, then uh, we need a different kind of monetary policy that maybe can do all those things. And so the final word before I finish is just a thought on the split between fiscal and monetary policy. We're all taught that the, you know, these are very, very separate things. Fiscal policy is done by elected governments because it has distributional consequences and we have to sort of tax and spend people. Um, and monetary policy is, is just a sort of technocratic thing. Leave that to independent central bankers and they will just make sure that we don't have high inflation. However, you know, we would say that um, actually there, there never has been that clear a separation, really. And it, because actually monetary policy is just delegated uh, under authority from democratic governments. It's a bit of a sleight of hand. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't think it's quite good to have independent uh, Bank of England, but nevertheless, all the current things we've got going on in some sense blur the boundaries between fiscal and monetary policy. QE, funding for lending, help to buy. Uh, these are all things that are monetary, uh, well, in two cases, explicitly monetary policy, QE, but they have, uh, f they stray into fiscal policy territory because the government actually guarantees potential losses on QE. So we've already got into this space of admitting that fiscal and monetary policy often are complementary or indeed the same thing. Now, could they actually be the same thing? Um, I'll leave you this final thought just because it's a particularly nice picture. Um, so this, this is what... Um, so this is what Adair Turner said about the idea that actually, if you think about it, fiscal and monetary policy could, in fact, be exactly the same thing. Because if governments uh, create money, then, and they no longer need to rely on financial markets, then their fiscal policy and their monetary policy look to be pretty, pretty well the same thing. And Martin Wolf, in fact, said only on Monday that the monetary and financial system is a complex private partner, public partnership, which I thought was a very nice way of saying Listen, you know, money creation and it is not a separate thing that is, that is done by the private sector. It is already very much guaranteed by the government, by all of us. So should we not have more control over how it is used and what it does? So that's the end. That's the three points that you have to remember again. And thank you very much.